Hey there, my name is Spencer Harmon and I am the campus pastor at First Baptist Church of Jacksonville at the Nocatee campus. Thank you so much for watching our sermon today. Our mission at our church is to reach all of Jacksonville with all of Jesus for all of life. If you'd like to join us for church in person, we are located just south of Jacksonville in the Nocatee community. We hope you participate with us however you are watching today's service as we worship Jesus, pray, and read his word. If you have any questions about today's message or just want to connect with us, you can find out more about our church at fbcjacks.com slash Nocatee or Facebook at First Baptist Church Jacksonville Nocatee Campus. Thanks so much for joining us. We are in uh, a study called The Fight for Faith. Uh, how do we fight for faith against temptation, against our sinful tendencies, against the things that come out of our hearts and our flesh, our, our worldliness, the things that come at us in spiritual warfare? How do we stand up to these things? And God has given us his word and specific instruction about specific challenges. And it's, I've really enjoyed the series. Pastor Spencer's been great at pointing out specific ways to deal with specific problems. And uh, we're going to do that again tonight. The topic tonight is how to fight for faith against bitterness. Bitterness. I was having a conversation with Ernie Baker one day and we were talking about some counseling, and uh, he made this statement about bitterness. He said, bitterness is the poison pill that we swallow thinking it will hurt the person that we're angry at. Bitterness is the poison pill that we swallow thinking that it will hurt the person that we're angry at. I think that's a true observation. Uh, and by the way, it doesn't work that way. Bitterness is always hurtful to us, and it's usually not hurtful to people beyond us unless we just spill over into their lives and become a sea of bitterness uh, in their life as well. Bitterness is something that we can readily identify with but may struggle to define. So I want to take a shot at giving some descriptives of it, and maybe you'll recognize it. I'm sure you will. Um, Bitterness is fuming resentment. Something happens in a person's life that they feel like they got the, the short end of the deal, that they were not treated fairly or properly, that they've been ignored, that they've been overlooked, and they are resentful. So much so that it just it permeates their outlook on things, particularly in relationships. Maybe it's something that happened at work and it affects their relationship with their peers at work and their working relationship with their boss. Or perhaps it's something that happened in the family. Somebody got something or has something and there's resentment about that and every time you're together there's this fuming resentment. Or bitterness could be gnawing hatred Somebody has done something to you um, over a period of time and maybe repetitively to the point that you just hate that person. You have strong feelings of hatred. We, we look at that person and can't stand to be around them. And it just gnaws at us as we're together with that person. Uh, bitterness could be seething anger. Uh, there's just a, a sense of an underlying anger. We're just the person is angry at the world and generally upset at everything. And it doesn't take much to cut across their path for that anger to burst out. It's just seething. It's like old faithful below the, the surface and the heat builds up just enough and, and there it goes and you see the tantrum and you hear the tantrum. That's a description of bitterness. Um, bitterness involves despising emotions. Emotions in which we are experiencing a despising disposition. Um, it comes out of the depths of a person, strongly influences their outlook on life, their own life, the life they see out beyond them, and then individual relationships. There is something in us that despises this situation, and we are really discontent over it. 
Bitterness is often expressed by loud, caustic words. It seems like the more bitter we are, the louder the volume can be. Or sometimes caustic words mumbled under our breath as we're walking away from the person, but just loud enough so that they can hear it. Or maybe it's name-calling, icy coldness, accusations, cynicism. Those are all expressions of a bitter heart. The causes of bitterness are as varied as the people who experience it. It doesn't flow in one particular aspect of life. It's generally, if we have experienced things in life that we don't like and that hurt us, create pain in us, or that we just despise, bitterness can very easily creep in and become the overbearing disposition of our life. It could arise from repetitive disappointments, painful deceptions, costly foolishness, either on your part, or usually on the part of someone else that's affected you, or it could be from abusive behaviors against you, hurtful, intentional hurts inflicted on you, long-lived pain, whether it's emotional pain or physical pain. After a long period of hurt, abuse, pain, emotional trauma, we can become bitter about that. Or bitterness could arrive from unsolvable problems, troubles that just will not go away, prevailing sadness, or hopelessness. You just don't see any hope for anything getting any better. And then the cynicism creeps in and the sadness overtakes us and the bitterness for why is this happening in my life? Why has this happened to me? Bitterness is painful, hurtful, and unwanted. Nobody wants to be bitter. But strangely, we often cling to it. We hold on to it because it's like that poison pill that we're taking, hoping that it will make everybody else as bitter as we are. I imagine most of you are familiar with bitterness and you could share your experiences with it, either personally, because I think we've all experienced bitterness at times in our lives, or you have been with someone in close association perhaps for a long period of time and they're bitter and their bitterness just flows out into your life and has really impacted you. Bitterness is common. <clears throat> it is um, life-changing and debilitating. What does God say about it? Well, there's a lot in Scripture that we could look at, but I'm going to just do a touch and go on three passages to set up the passage we're going to look at for this message. What does God say about bitterness? Psalm 64, 3, they have sharpened their tongue like a sword. They aimed bitter speech as their arrow to shoot from concealment at the blameless. Suddenly they shoot at him and do not fear. Well, that's a word picture, isn't it? You can see them in the shadows. They're stringing their, their bow with, with bitterness, and they're, they're ready to, to fire just as soon as you step into the light. They're going to let that thing go and let it hit, hit its mark, which is your heart, and they're not going to think, think about it. They're going to be glad about it. Or it's like the sword. The tongue is like a sword. You can see them just sharpening the edge of that sword. And then when you come along, they just whoosh, cut you with it. Bitterness attacks. Bitterness is on the offensive. Hebrews 12, 15. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it, this root of bitterness, many be defiled. The word defiled speaks about corruption. 
soiling, ruining. Take the image of, uh, of a bride's wedding dress, and she's having an outdoor wedding in Georgia, and she gets caught in the rain, and everywhere around is Georgia clay. And that Georgia clay gets all over that wedding dress, and it's just it's ruined. That's just a little picture of what this word defiled means. It, it gets on everything, and it can't be cleaned. It can't be undone. It ruins everything. It corrupts everything. It corrupts relationships. It corrupts outlooks. It corrupts the ability to live life freely. It defiles many. So bitterness attacks. It spreads trouble. It defiles others. Ephesians 4.31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Bitterness, God says, has no place in the Christian life. It is to be put away from you. It's common for the world to experience bitterness. He says, it is not to be part of your life. Therefore, we as Christians must fight the tendency towards bitterness, whether it's gross bitterness or whether it's just daily discontent and a snappiness and a, and a quick temper and a sharp word that, that shoots. All of that is rooted in a heart of bitterness. And it's hurtful to you and it's hurtful to those in your life. So, God does not want us to have bitterness in our life. He tells us it is to be put away. So how do we do that? Our text is Colossians 3. I'm going to look at verses 1 through 14, but I'm going to focus on verses 5 through 14. So look at Colossians 3, 5 with me. Therefore, consider the members of your body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them. But now you also have put them all aside. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. If you contrast Paul's list in Colossians with the list in Ephesians 4 that I read to you, he, the Ephesians 4 list starts with bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, malice. Here in Colossians, he's saying anger, wrath, malice, slander, abuse of speech from your math, mouth. And I take that to mean that all of that is a description of bitterness. It is what bitterness does. It is the acts of bitterness. So here Paul links acts, A-C-T-S, acts, actions, visible, verbal, audible evidences of bitterness. He links these to dispositions in the heart. He says there are evil desires at work in you that produce this anger, wrath, malice, bitterness action. So in doing that, he helps us understand how do I deal with this tendency, this temptation towards bitterness? How do I undo bitterness in my heart? We have to look at the heart motive, the evil desire. That's an inward motive. It's not an action. It's a motive. It's a motivation. Something is motivating the actions. And the actions are the things that we see and hear and feel when we're experiencing bitterness the things that come out of our mouth, and things that we act like, oh, I wish I hadn't said that, I wish I hadn't done that, why did you do that? <laughs> that stuff that we're so familiar with, he's saying, is driven by motives. So we've got to look at the motives in order to get rid of the behaviors. So I want you to see three components of dealing with bitterness from God's Word in this text. Number one, Fighting against bitterness requires, one, identifying the idolatry at the heart of the bitterness. Identifying the idolatry at the heart of the bitterness. And that comes out of the verse 5c. It's the very end of verse, verse 5. 
he lists these motives, this, um, these heart dispositions, immorality, murder, um, uh, impurity, passion, evil desire, greed, which amounts to idolatry. He's saying all of these things have their being in idolatry. Now we've got to deal with idolatry a little bit. Most of us would say, well, I'm, I'm not an idolater. You know, an idolater is someone who carries around a, a rock and bows to that rock and expects that rock to do something for them. Well, yes, that was a form of idolatry, but the heart is the same. The heart of the rock worshiper is the same as the heart of the food worshiper or the sex worshiper or the clothing worshiper or the money worshiper. It's just, the idols have just changed. There's still material things that we look to, either material things or people or systems that we look to for hope, success, security, prestige, affirmation, comfort, power, praise, acclaim. Whatever it is that's in you that wants something and you're looking to this thing or this system of things makes you an idolater, makes me an idolater. Paul says right there, immorality, which is sexual in nature, impurity, which is everything that's uh, immoral that's not of a sexual nature, passions, which is just lust of all kinds, evil desire, that's, that's criminal desire, that's just... That's just pure badness and greed. All of that's driven. He said all that amounts to idolatry. People want what they want. They're going to sin to get it. They don't care who they hurt. They don't care what it costs. They're just going to get what they want. That's what's driving that. That's idolatry. So bitterness comes from something that we desire to have but can't have. Um. Maybe it's respect or affection. I've, I've already listed those. Uh, attention, control. Despite long efforts, fervent efforts, you've given all your energy to get this thing, to make it work for you. It just won't come. It doesn't give what you want. Or the person doesn't give what you want. Or the way, in what, in the way you want it given. And they become discontented and upset and accusative because you won't do what the idol in my heart wants you to do. And I start to become bitter. So through the failures or, of, or sins of other people, I am disappointed. I am deflated. I am frustrated. I am thwarted. My desire cannot be met and so I lash out in anger. And then I swallow the poison pill of bitterness, and I want to make you hurt. So then I start hurting. I start spewing bitterness in order to make you hurt. So bitterness can come from something we desire to have. We can readily identify those kinds of idols. But also bitterness comes from something we do not desire to have, but it keeps coming to you. You don't want it, but it keeps coming to you. Disrespect, conflict, abuse, pressure, pain, distress, others' sin that just keeps coming and keeps coming and their sin is ruining your life and you can't get rid of it and you're sick of it and you won't stand for it anymore. Your hopes and dreams and your longings are being tossed aside. This person is ruining your life, and you won't stand for it anymore, and you swallow the pill of bitterness, and you begin to lash out. So bitterness can come from something we want, something we don't want. On the surface, these appear to be maybe legitimate excuses. Legitimate reasons to be bittered. You could sit down and tell stories about what this person has done, that person has done, how I've been overlooked and didn't get this and didn't get that. And those may all sound absolutely legit. But there is no legitimate reason for bitterness in the heart of a Christian. 
because bitterness is sin. God forbids bitterness. He says, for these reasons, the wrath of God comes on the sons of disobedience. You used to live in these things, but now you have put them all aside. Anger, wrath, malice, bitter envy. You, you set all that aside because you have replaced it with something better. Bitterness is seen, sin. It incurs the wrath of God. Uh, bitterness is sin because it is a failure of faith. I am angry about something because it didn't work out the way I wanted it to work out. I had it all laid out. I had it planned. This person's messing it all up. Well, what that is saying is, I haven't talked to God about this. I don't consider God's sovereignty over my life at all. I, I'm captain of my life. I'm leading my life. This person's messing it up. Well, what about God? Is God in control of that person or that set of circumstances that have so frustrated your life? Absolutely he is. God is sovereign over all things. He controls all things. He's working for good in all things, even pain, even things that cause bitterness. So if we have set our hope on an idol that has failed us, our bitterness is not justified. It is sin at work in us. And God will allow you to have your idol and let it fail and let you hurt in order to show you that you should not have idols in your life because they're weak, lying, failing, deceptive, sin-inducing, ungodly, unglorious idols. And he wants you to see that. He wants you to hate it so that you turn to him and say, I hate that. I want you. He will let you experience the pain of idol worship, the disappointment of it, so that you'll turn and repent. We know that idol worship is sin because when the idol of our hearts is thwarted, we inevitably respond in sinful behaviors. And he gives a list of them in verse 8. When he says, put them all aside, anger. That's the word we would say is fury. Fury. I'm furious. Well, you're sinning in this situation. Wrath. We would say outbursts, temper tantrums, words that just blow up, outbursts. Malice. We would say hatred. I hate you. I hate you. I hate that guy. I hate my work. I hate life. Slander, we would say demeaning. We demean people. We cut them to shreds. We put them down. We, we make them small so that we look good. We cast all the blame on them. We cut the heart out of their life in order to make our heart bigger. Demeaning. And abusive speech that would be obscenities flowing out of your mouth. When idolatry is uncovered, when the idolater is disappointed and thwarted in their idol worship and the idol, doesn't disapp um, the idol disappoints and does not do what it said it was going to do, we come forth with behaviors that are always sinful behaviors. That's how we know that bitterness is a root that must be taken out of the Christian's heart. There is no excuse for it. There is no, there, there may be a justification in your mind for it, but there is not in God's mind because bitterness comes out of idol worship and a failure in faith. So, to fight bitterness, the idols of the heart must be identified and put aside. How do you do that? Let's apply that. The idols of the heart must be identified and put aside. You must put them all aside, Paul says. You have to uncover, I have to uncover what's at the heart of our bitterness. Why am I angry? 
Why am I bitter? And it has to be beyond, well, they did this and they did that. Okay, they did those things. But why has that made you angry? What did you really want that they won't do? What's at the heart of your anger, your disappointment? Why are you so upset? Clearly, there are some awful things that happen in life. Abuse, serial abusers are just rampant. Those are awful things. And when that happens, we want to help you as a church to get in a safe place and to work towards reconciliation if that's possible. So I'm taking that gross case and saying when somebody is physically, mentally, emotionally, verbally in an abusive situation, we can understand why bitterness will come. But God doesn't want your heart to be bitter. And and I'm I'm, I'm saying that now, that sounds so um, foolish, simplistic. I hope by the end of the message it's not. Generally, when I am bitter, it is because I have something, I want something that is sinful, that I have looked away from Christ for my joy in, and I have placed it on this thing, and I can't have that thing, and I'm pitching a tantrum. There's sin in my heart, and I need to know what am I looking to that thing to do for me that I'm not looking to God to do. I've got to know that so that I can see it for what it is Repent of it, confess it, ask God to take it out, cut it out, because it's killing me. It's not doing me any good. It's ruining my life and the lives of those around me. So ask the question, what am I really wanting? What do I worship that's not God? Number two, fighting bitterness requires killing your idol-worshiping desire. Okay, now that I know what it is, what is in me that is itching to have that thing satisfy me? What is it about my heart that is looking to that rather than looking to Christ? I've got to kill my idol-worshiping desire. Verse 5. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead. Let me give you the literal interpretation of that language. Put to death the members which are upon the earth. So the, ES, or the uh, New American Standard says, consider the members of your earthly body as dead. Okay, that, that's not as active as it should be. Put to death the members of your body because they are dead, would be a better understanding of that. Part of your old nature is acting as though it's alive. If you are in Christ, you died when Jesus died. Your sin nature died when Jesus died. It's dead. So why does it feel so alive? Why is it acting as though it's alive? It's worshiping something. It's wanting something. It's having evil desires. It is producing in me behaviors that are ungodly. Why? Let's look at verse 3 of chapter 3. Colossians 3.3. 3. For you have died. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. All right, let me give you a there's, a, there's a past tense and there's a future tense in there. There's a, a past action and there's a future action. The past action is that you have died. Your life has been hidden with Christ in God. Your sin nature, your fleshly nature was nailed to the cross with Christ. It was put in the grave and buried. It was done away with. When Jesus rose out of the grave, you rose up with him. You are now a new creation in Christ Jesus. Sin has passed away. All things are made new. You are alive unto God. So that happened with Christ. And by faith, 
You have entered into the life of Christ. Your sin nature is dead. Your glory is yet to come. When Christ is revealed, then you will be revealed with him in glory. So my sin nature has died. It's done away. My glorious nature has yet to be fulfilled, and I'm living in between. So I have a sin nature that wants to be glorified now. It wants what it wants now. It wants its treasures now. It wants to be a friend of the world now because being a friend of the world now is kind of nice and comfortable and it strokes my ego and it makes me feel fulfilled and I'm glad to have the things that I have and they will make me happy. No. That's what idolatry says. If you're a friend of the world, you're the enemy of God. So while we're in the world, we don't live for the world's glory. We live for Christ's glory, which will be revealed with him when his glory is fully revealed. So fighting bitterness means I've got to kill the worship, idol-worshiping desire that remains in me. Let me give you this illustration, and maybe it'll help. Like a patient on life support we tend to keep alive that which actually is dead. Giving it what it needs to live. I have tendencies in my mind and my flesh that like the things of the earth. And it's great to like the things of the earth because God made all things beautiful and all things wonderful and all things to be enjoyed. He's given us all things richly to enjoy. But as soon as I make that God in my life, it's no longer a good thing. I have, like Eve and Adam, turned away from what God has said in the glory of God and the fellowship of God and the fulfillment of God. And I have looked on this thing and I said, I'll be like God. I want this. This will make me fulfilled and I go after it. I can't. i got to kill that. I've got to kill that. I cannot sustain that nature, that desire in me. I've got to kill that desire. How do you do that? Quit feeding the sinning members of your body the food that they require to stay alive. Stop feeding the sinful tendencies, the things that you know you have a proclivity for that can become gods in your life, little g-gods. Stop feeding what makes that live. Let me give you some examples. In your mind, starve your mind of the food of lust, worldly success, worldly reasoning, worldly wisdom, worldly acclaim, worldly comforts, Sexual titillation. Stop feeding your mind that. And you'll kill that desire. The hands. Starve them of the food of selfish gain. Why do you work the way you do? Is it to amass stuff so that you don't have to depend on God? You don't have to walk by faith? You can be comfort. You can be in control. You can be powerful. You can have everything, anything that you want. Is that why you work? That's an easy reason to work, but it's not a godly reason to work. So we need to starve our hands for, of the selfish gain that motivates our doing. Um, and conversely, starve our hands of the idleness of the comfort lover. I want comfort. I want to lay down. I, when I get home, I don't want the kids to say a peep. I want the game on the TV. I want the dinner on the table. I want it all to be straight up, all nice and neat and organized, and I don't want to be disturbed. I want to be in my lazy boy. Leave me alone. Well, that's what the God of comfort says. And the God of comfort will keep you in that chair on Saturday morning, Friday nights, serving yourself while your marriage goes to ruin, your kids grow up not knowing you and perhaps despising you, your work doesn't get done. So there's a both and. There's a tension here, right? I'm going to work as unto the Lord. That means I'm not going to be lazy as unto the Lord, but I am going to relax in the Lord 
and thank him for that while I work in the Lord. He's given us both. But I'm going to starve my hands of selfish gain, selfish serving. Ears. I'm going to starve the ears of the food of self-esteem. I'm not going to listen for people to tickle my ears. I'm not going to listen for flattery. I'm not going to set myself up for somebody to say something good about me. I'm not going to be manipulating people in relationships so that they'll like me. Stop feeding your ears self-esteem and flattery and information gathering so that you can know everything that needs to be known. You can be in the know and you can be the gossiper who's communicating all this stuff about everybody. Stop feeding your ears those things. Stop feeding your mouth of boasting, demanding, critiquing, eating and drinking in excess, which again is a comfort action. So many of these are rooted in idolatrous desires. I want to be in control, I want to be comfortable, I want to be safe. I want to be affirmed. I want to be praised. That's the idol at work in my behaviors. And I've got to starve those things. I've, got to, I've just got to starve it so that the idol is weak and is no longer influencing my behavior. Being aware of your heart's idol, cut off all it needs to survive. Die to sinful self-interest daily. Say no to temptation. Don't play with temptation. Oh, it'll kill you. It's bigger and badder than you are. It'll kill you. Why would you want to play with something that God says will kill you? Don't play with temptation. Avoid tempting situations. Refuse to let your body and your lusts rule you. Unplug the life support system that feeds your fleshly worship. That's step number two. Fighting bitterness requires that you identify your heart's idols, that you cut off what feeds your sinful desire. You put away those things. And then number three, Paul says that we are to put on Christ. The third step in fighting bitterness requires setting your desire on Christ. So we're going to replace these lusts, these fleshly desires, these things that we are counting on as little G gods. We're going to say no to that, but I've got to replace that. I can't leave this vacuum in my heart. I've got to replace it, and I'm going to replace it with Christ. Colossians 3.1. Colossians 3.1. If you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. So he's saying your life, if you're a believer in Christ, is really with God. It is really with Christ. And it's not just in the future. It's now. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. Everything that you desire to have can be fulfilled with God. Jesus says, ask anything according to my will, and I'll do it. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. God is rich in mercy and grace. He desires to bless you richly. He will satisfy your longings. But you've got to go after him. He is not one among many gods. He is God, or he is not in your heart. Verse 12 Colossians 3.12. So as those who have been chosen of God, think about God chose you. He chose to set his love on you, holy and beloved. Put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another, forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. That's a great list. I want to do those things. Man, I struggle. I struggle to do those things. How am I going to put on those things? Put on Christ. He is those things. They are the fruit of the Spirit of Christ Jesus in you. He will produce these things that delight your heart, that fulfill your soul. 
You plug into the life support support system that is Jesus, and you receive his life-giving heart. And he does his work in you so that you have compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, forbearance, forgiveness, love. I want to be that person. I want to live with that person, don't you? (laughs) I want to be that person towards my wife. I want her to be that person towards me because that's going to make for a very happy marriage. I want Jesus to do that in me because that's going to make for a very happy life. It is going to fulfill everything that I'm longing for. He talks about love being the perfect bond of unity, the the thing that unites us perfectly. How does that work? It's impossible to be bitter at someone when you are acting toward them in love. They may still be knuckleheads. They may still be breaking your heart. But because you are loved by the Most High God, because God has set His love on you, because your hope is in God, you can love them even when your heart is breaking towards them. And you do not have to be bitter towards them. Because God has made your heart one with His. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance, self-control. God will do that in you. How do we know that he will? Because that's what Jesus did when he was stretched out with spikes through his ankles and through his wrists. The skin ripped off of his body, baking in the afternoon sun, insects eating him alive, beard snatched out of his face, crown of thorns pressed onto his head, mockery, Spitting, laughter, shame, nakedness. What did Jesus do? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. John, look at your mother. Mother, look at your son. Judas railing against him. Ah, if he could, if he was God, he would come down from that cross. Let him save himself. Earlier, Jesus had told Peter, Peter, don't you know that I could call on my father and he would send legions of angels to deliver me from this? But he didn't. Why? Because he didn't become bitter. He loved. Jesus loved in the face of consequences that should have caused him to be bitter. More than any person who's ever walked the globe, Jesus should have been a bitter person. But he wasn't because he had the love of the Father in him. He was overflowing with the love and the joy and the glory and the delight of God. No matter what pain he was enduring, and it was pain, what shame he was bearing, and it was shame, he despised it. Yet he did not sin. Instead, he loved to the very end. That's what God will do in you and me when we turn to him in the midst of our bitterness and say, God, I'm worshiping an idol that has failed me. I repent. Forgive me. Deliver me from it. Kill what is wanting that in me. Fill it with you. I turn to you. Fill me with you. Make my heart like your heart. And you may continue to suffer, but God, even in the suffering, will give you the ability to go through it with love, with joy, with peace that passes understanding. And you don't have to live a bitter life anymore. You can be delivered of it. The poison pill of bitterness is the product of an unfaithful heart that feeds its idols, preferring them over Christ. But if you are in Christ, your life is with Him, not the stuff of the world. So discover your idols.
Kill in you what serves those idols. Set your hope, your love, your desire on Christ and ask God to do what only God can do in you. And you'll be rid of bitterness. He'll set you free from what you are experiencing. We hope you enjoyed today's sermon. If you have questions about the message, reach out to us at askapastor at fbcjax.com. We meet for services every Sunday morning and Wednesday evening. So for more information, you can go to fbcjax.com slash Nocatee. Thank you for watching, and we are praying for you as you go reaching all of Jacksonville with all of Jesus for all of life.